It's the MasterChef semi-finals. After four weeks of intense competition, 40 home cooks have been whittled down to the best 10. I think I'm fine. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> well, let me down. Can't believe I'm back for the semi-finals. Now I'm up against the best of the best, and I just want to take it up a notch. I didn't realize up till this point that I wanted it this much. The things that we spend our time doing should ignite a passion in us, and this competition has definitely done that to me. I'm rolling up my sleeve ready to yeah, fight against the other contestant. It's just beyond my wildest dreams to actually be here, given the year that we're all going through, to be perfectly honest. Tonight, the first group of five return. They'll have to impress one of Britain's top chefs for the right to cook in their first professional kitchen. Cooked some amazing food so far in this competition. From here on in, they're going to have to wow. One mistake could prove costly. Get it wrong right now, you're out. Welcome to the MasterChef semi-final. You've done incredibly well. We need you to keep on delivering. We want from you a star dish, a dish that you would be proud to put on your menu in a restaurant, to publish in a cookbook, or put in a pop-up. You have one hour and 45 minutes to cook for us extraordinary food, because at the end of this, three of you will be continuing your journey in MasterChef but sadly, two of you will be going home. Ladies and gentlemen, let's cook. This is about aspiration. This is about them dreaming that they're going to make a name for themselves in the industry. They have to put their stamp on it. Stefan's an architect and he constructs food. He loves the process and he loves to do lots of them. Some of these constructions are a little bit odd, but somehow or another, it works. Being an architect does help. It does also put relative, I suppose, amount of pressure on my plating. People will be expecting me to make pretty food. Key to me today is to get the flavors right but I would like to make something beautiful. What's the dish, please? So it's inspired by two of my loves, city and urbanism and ecology. So my plate today is inspired by going for a walk in a British woodland and then coming back into an urbanity. Tell me how you're going to represent that in a dish, please. So the dish is sous vide and then pan-fried wood pigeon, red cabbage puree, celeriac fondant, sat on a bed of rainbow chard, brought together with a little Bonbon made of the pigeon and some mushroom sauce. Tell me where the countryside meets the city on this dish, please. The rainbow chard, the mushrooms, it's rustic. These are all earthy flavours to me. So the fondant, the sous vide, the way it's brought forward as, I suppose, something more city. Where do you see this dish being presented? Street food store, fine dining restaurant. I can imagine this could be served anywhere. Stefan's a man who loves to do things with lots and lots of elements, and this pigeon dish he's going to cook for us has loads of elements. Stefan is doing between 10 and 11 components for his dish. Running around the kitchen is not going to get the job done. I love Claire. Claire has definitely got a style, and that style is local British produce. She's a bit of a beach coma forager. She is cooking on MasterChef, honestly, what she cooks at home, and it's great. So I've called the dish home turf. Other people might call it surf and turf. My home turf is the flavours of Kent and Romney Marsh. So 
So today you've got ox cheeks in a herb pancake with monkfish in prosciutto on some pureed celeriac with chicory and a panisse. What's a panisse? So it's chickpea fritter. Are you doing posh surf and turf? I call it home turf. So I've got friends who are cattle farmers, so the ox cheeks kind of in tribute to that. And there was monkfish around, it came in on the boats when I kind of devised this dish. I would like to write a journal about living on Romney Marsh, which would include delicious recipes. Not everyone goes through today. How do you feel about that? Gutted. Better make sure it's not you then, right? Let's hope. Claire is going for a plate of food which sounds to me as though lots of little things that she likes to eat. We have. A piece of monkfish wrapped in ham. We have a braised ox cheek, which is then going to be served inside a herb pancake. I wonder if they really belong together. 30 minutes gone. 30 minutes gone, guys. Smells good. Mark is a fashion designer, and you can see that sort of creativity in his food. John, his dish may come from China. It may come from Korea, but you won't have seen a dish like it before, I can guarantee that. Mark is taking some really classic French ideas and then he's adding his own twist to them. We have a ballantine of chicken and he's filled it with a mixture of Chinese sausage, lap chan, water chestnuts, some snow crab meat and Japanese seaweed and wrap the whole chicken ballantine in rice, so it's like sushi. Then he's got a lollipop, your lovely thin layer of prawn puree, wrapped around a broccoli flour, coated in sesame seeds, and then deep fried. The whole lot is served with a classic dish, which is pom alagot, potatoes and cheese. Can't wait to see what it looks like. I just hope it eats well. Where does your inspiration for food come from? Because I love traveling. I'm from Hong Kong, so I get to travel like so many Asian countries, like for example, Japan, Korea, Thailand, like you name it. I also like to travel France when East meets rest. Yeah. How many times have you made this dish before? Only one time. Because yeah, I don't have much time to practice. Where would this dish present itself? In a restaurant, and you can try it with paying me <laughs> instead of getting it for free here. <laughs> Being safe won't keep you in competition at this stage, for sure. It's good to be risky and then to, to gamble a bit. Because I'm not like really technical, so I have to use other strength, which is my creativity. 30 minutes left, please. Tom has got a fascinating style where he uses European cookery technique and introduces Asian flavours. His food looks glorious, it's exciting, and it's got skill. So I'm really going to be pushing myself today, but I've done it at home. But as we all know, the pressure of the MasterChef kitchen is a little bit different. Tom's cooking for us sous vide chicken breast with spray onions, ginger, and sesame oil. On top of that, he's putting a Japanese seasoning called farakaki, dried fish roe. Inside there, there'll be seaweed, there'll be sesame seeds. So it's almost like a salt that goes across the top, like a Japanese salt. He's going to serve that with a deep-fried ballantine, a popcorn flavor with bonito or dried tuna. Then he's got sweet corn, which he's going to put with kombu butter. Kombu being a very, very thick seaweed from Japan. This is an extraordinary dish, and lots of things going on, but it is three ingredients. Chicken, seaweed, and sweet corn. So I really want to write about food. The reason I chose chicken today was because a lot of the first cookbooks that I had had iconic chicken recipes in them. Where do your ideas come from? From all over the place. I quite often go to Asian supermarkets and I love to pick up things that I'm unfamiliar with and see what I can do with them at home. Do you think you're different? Yeah, I think so. I hope so. That's kind of what I want to show while I'm here. behave yourself now. <gasps> That's a relief. 
Medea has shown herself to be a cook who loves to feed people. Every time we've eaten the food, we've absolutely loved it. It's been generous in spirit, generous in flavour. She has spent time in the Middle East and Pakistan, and her food illustrates that beautifully. It's quite a journey that I've made from just being a loving, caring, home cook, mum, and now being a semi-finalist. Still can't believe I've made it this far. Oh, my God. You look to me like you're doing a dessert. Yes, I'm the only one. What is it you're making? Tropical fruit and fresh cream layered cake with a passion fruit caramel, passion fruit and mango sorbet, and a curried coconut crumb. Hopefully dressed beautifully. And where does the inspiration for this dish come from? It goes all the way back 30, 35 years. It's from one of my dad's best friends. Is this a family favourite? It? It's a family favourite, but it's a favourite for millions in Pakistan, India and Bangladesh. And if this was going to appear anywhere, where would it be? Every single person who has eaten it has asked me for a recipe, so why not put it in a book? <laughs> Medea is the only person in the room making a dessert. She's using tropical fruit, passion fruit, mango and pineapple. The whole cake is going to be covered in cream. You just have to make sure it looks pretty. Could look like something you get for afternoon tea rather than actually as a dessert. Ten minutes, everybody. I've practised playing it before, so I feel good about this one. MasterChef semi-final, we've invited in a special guest. Anna Hall, chef proprietor of restaurant Myrtle. And she's going to help us. Help us to judge, because she understands what it takes for somebody to actually make that transition to a restaurateur. She's worked in some of the best kitchens in the country, and she is now cooking to serious critical acclaim. I think a fantastic judge for these five. I'm so excited to be here today. The idea that I'm going to taste five dishes that a lot of love and passion and thought, hopefully, has gone into, I mean, who wouldn't be excited about that? Listen up very carefully. You have three minutes. I hope to see not too many ingredients on the plate. Feeling like uh, there's a lot going on? I'm stressed. I hope to see ingredients that want to hold hands together. The prosciutto is just not stuck to the monkfish. Sounds like a cook blaming their tools, doesn't it? No matter how we dress it up or how pretty a dish looks, if it doesn't taste nice, it's, it's worthless. 60 seconds, please. How's that looking, Medea? It's looking all right. Is it? For the time being. Oh. It needed to go in the fridge, but it didn't go in the fridge, but it's all right. Whoa. Final touches, 10 seconds, final touches. That's it. Time's up. Stop. <sighs> Today is a big day, and there are big decisions to be made. We have invited a special guest in to help us make a decision. I think one of the most exciting culinary talents in Britain today has worked in Michelin star kitchens in Paris, Dublin, and London, was head chef for Gordon Ramsay, and now owns her own restaurant in Chelsea in London. Ladies and gentlemen, Anna Hall. Hello, Anna. Hi, hello, Greg. <laughs> Hi, John. I am so excited to try all of your dishes today. Tom, we're ready if you are, please. Front of house restaurant manager Tom has served sous vide chicken breast topped with chicken skin furikake, deep fried rolled chicken leg, corn puree, corn in seaweed butter, bonito tuna popcorn, 
wakame seaweed powder and a soya chicken sauce. That is a striking looking dish, Tom. Do I like it? I love it. Your sprinkling of seasoning across the top of the chicken breast is inspired. Chicken breast is beautifully cooked. The corn puree is smooth and silky. The sauce reduced with soy, the little bit of sake, so it's slightly sweet and salty. I've got no complaints at all. I could eat my body weight in popcorn. <laughs> I love it. This bonito flake flavor that is on it is absolutely delicious. The skill of your perfectly cooked chicken leg, then rolled, is a lovely addition. For an amateur cook, this is a very impressive plate of food. It is such a majestic dish in look, texture and flavour. If I sat down in a, in a smart restaurant, I would be impressed. Thank you. I feel amazing right now. Couldn't have done that dish any better. So I've got a good feeling about this one. Would you join us, please, Claire? Policy advisor Claire is serving what she calls home turf, a herb pancake filled with ox cheek, monkfish wrapped in prosciutto, braised endive, panisse or fried chickpea flour, celeriac puree and gremolata. Everything on here, I think, is cooked really, really well. Love the soft monkfish in the ham, which is just slightly crispy. Your syriac puree, I think, is divine. Really rich, still woody. Really love the flavour of that herb pancake. But the ox cheek and the pancake, with the monkfish and the ham, I'm finding them a bit too much. OK. Gremolata smelled amazing. I was like, when can I start eating? <laughs> it was really delicious. And the panisa are a lovely element in it. There's just one real element that I kind of feel doesn't belong there, which is the endive. But it's a lovely plate of food. Thank you. Your cooking of your monkfish is perfect. I'm really impressed by the softness of the ox cheek. You're showing a really good touch and good technique throughout the plate. I took a risk. That was lovely feedback. Absolutely lovely. Fashion designer Mark has made a chicken ballotine stuffed with snow crabs, water chestnut and Chinese pork sausage, wrapped in sushi rice, served with a broccoli prawn and sesame lollipop, with pom aligo, crispy prosciutto and spring onion oil. This is an incredibly exciting plate of food. That mash was silky smooth, super delicious. Cheese was amazing, so fabulous. Your lollipop, full of flavor, yum, yum, yum. I'd eat 10 of them, gorgeous. But it didn't really relate to the Ballantine. I didn't see how I would eat the two of them together. Your chicken Ballantine has gone dry. The crab is being lost amongst that very strong pork Chinese sausage. There's lots of work on here. I admire your intention, I love your invention. It's not for me. The sticky rice with the chicken is making that quite chewy. It's a hugely experimental dish, which is fine. I've got a feeling it needs some work. It's definitely too risky, but I mean, I, I don't regret. And I received some feedback, so I know what to improve in the future. Stefan, would you please, sir? Architect Stefan is serving sous vide wood pigeon topped with crispy shallots on a red cabbage puree, pickled beetroot, a celeriac fondant, a pigeon and pancetta bonbon, braised rainbow chard, chard onions filled with a chimichurri sauce, fried mushrooms, and a pigeon and red wine sauce. It's a very memorable looking dish. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's fun. I clearly can see your personality on a plate here and, and I love to see that.
I think you've managed to conjure up some really big, big flavour that I think actually does work together. I particularly love that celeriac. That is properly buttery and really soft. I love the bite you've got on those little shallots. I have, however, got two issues. One is your sauce is obviously split and your bonbon feels grainy. I like the pigeon breast with the red cabbage and the pickled vegetables, but the mushrooms aren't seasoned at all. The actual bonbon is gone dry, which is a real shame. When you're doing so many elements, it's always going to be really difficult to make sure everyone is absolutely right and belongs together. This pigeon, it's exactly how I like to eat it. The red cabbage and the beetroot are earthy. However, there's a lot going on here. You've got to be able to rein it back. It's still a bit of a blur. I mean, there was good bits, bad bits. Uh, I'm in a bit of a whirlwind. I think I gave myself a bit too much to do. Finally, it's market researcher Madiha, who served tropical fruit and fresh cream cake with a passion fruit caramel sauce, a pineapple crisp, freeze-dried passion fruit dust with mango and passion fruit sorbet on a curried coconut crumb. This mango sorbet is just divine. Your sponge is as light as a feather, as is your cream. That's not too sweet. Maybe it could be smarter, but I tell you what, I'd happily finish it and ask for seconds. I loved all the tropical flavours. I thought they were really interesting. The sponge is super light, but still moist, which is technically very difficult. The curried coconut is also very nice. There's a lovely little acidity coming through in your passion fruit caramel, but perhaps if you just used a cutter and made an individual little gateau, wouldn't have to change anything flavour-wise and it would just look a little bit more elegant. Medea, the sorbet and the crumb I think is great, but I would have liked this to have been just a bit more dainty because at the moment it's quite unwieldy and, and big. I was happy that they enjoyed it, they liked the flavours, but could have been a bit more neater. Incredible cookery. Anna, what's your overall feeling on this? Very impressive. There was a few little slip-ups, but in general, I see five people with some really great potential and makes it even more difficult that two of them have to go home. Thank you very much for all your efforts. Anna, absolutely delightful having you on here. Brilliant. Oh, I was delighted to be here. I was blown away. Anna, thank you very much for your comments. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bye. Anna. See you later. Semi-final day of the MasterChef Kitchen, and it's been a big day, I have to say. We've got a tough decision. Three of them go to the next round, two of them are going home. There definitely was a dish of the day, and that was Tom. John, it was beautiful, and it tasted just as good as it looked. Tom is a star. Tom goes through the next round. Yeah, he's the standout cook, and then after that, it all gets a little bit tricky. I love Mark's adventure, but today, that dish, it wasn't practised enough, it wasn't honed enough. He is exciting, but if he's going to invent like that, he's got to also put in the practice time. Stefan, he's not settling for safe, and a lot of it works, and some of it doesn't. He's trying to do too much. But you can't deny his spirit. Claire, ox cheek was cooked really well, pancakes beautifully made. A piece of monkfish wrapped in ham is a very, very brave dish to do. I admire all the technical cookery skill and the touch. There's lots of things on a plate, but they didn't quite belong together. Medea made for us a cake flavoured with mango and pineapple. The cake was big. For me, that sorbet and the curry coconut crumb, I thought was wonderful. We know what we're disappointed in, and it's not the cooking, it's the presentation. Big decision. Who's going through with Tom and who's going home? Yes, I could have done better, particularly with the presentation. I hope it doesn't cost me the competition. To be honest, I'm not really sure if I have done enough. 
You never know. We will see. Think it cross again. I would love to stay in the competition. Absolutely. You've got to be in it to win it. So I tried. If I was to make it through to the next round, I would be grateful to the judges. Best of luck to the competitors, but I want to make it through. There are some talented cooks in this room, and you need to be very proud of what you've achieved so far. First person going through the next round, it's Tom. Very good, Tom. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Not all of you can stay in the competition. The first person leaving us. is Mark. Mark, love your invention. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Second person going through to the next round. It's Claire. Claire, congratulations. Thank you so much. <laughs> Madiha, Stefan, we have one place left. The second person leaving us. Stefan. Thank you very much for everything. Thanks, Stefan. I feel sad. I was looking forward to the next potential stages, but not to be. Just tough competition. I'm a little bit disappointed and upset for sure, but at least I made it to semi-final. I was like a baby before, but now, yeah, I have grown and I'm ready to fly. <laughs> very, very well done. Yes. <laughs> you are doing brilliantly well. We want to take your food up to the next level. We are sending you to one of London's leading restaurants, and you are getting your first taste of a proper professional kitchen. It's early morning, and Madiha, Claire, and Tom are about to experience the intense pressure of their first professional restaurant service at Trivet in Bermondsey, South London. I work front of house in a restaurant, going into a professional kitchen. I know what that stress and pressure looks like, so hopefully that'll serve me well. It's all very real now. This is one dream I dreamt for the last 12 years. And it has finally materialised, it has come true. I've never waited, I've never done any type of restaurant job. To be honest, I'm slightly terrified. The semi-finalists will be working under chef patron Johnny Lake. Originally from Canada, Johnny studied physics and biology at university before having an unconventional introduction to the world of gastronomy. When I was finishing my science degree, I needed a job. I actually started working at Meals on Wheels. You'd cook the meals for mainly elderly people who couldn't get out of their house and deliver them on a bike, and I thought it was so cool. A passion for cooking ignited, Johnny retrained as a chef then headed across the Atlantic where he cooked in some of the best kitchens in Europe. 
In 2005, Johnny was given an opportunity to combine his love of food and science when he was offered a job at the legendary Fat Duck in Bray during its formative years. It was a very small team at the time, tiny kitchen, very intense. But I was really motivated, trying to learn as much as I could. After 12 years as executive head chef, in 2019, he and head sommelier Isabal decided to step out on their own with Trivet, which opened to critical acclaim. The food style of Trivet is very eclectic, drawing influences from all different cultures, using modern and old technique, trying to make the most interesting flavor combinations we can. Today, it's going to be hard. It's going to be quite challenging for them. They've got to try to stay focused and not get frustrated and throw everything at it. Hello. Welcome to Trivet. I've got three dishes to show you today and for you to replicate. They're all very important to me personally. They were all dishes that uh, we developed for the opening menu. We can't be open to the public, so you're going to be cooking for our staff. They know these dishes inside and out. They know exactly how they should taste, how they should look. We're going to have a good time, OK? So just follow me. Thank you. The contestants will have three hours to prepare their dishes for the lunchtime tasting menu for Johnny's team. Madiha will be responsible for a red mullet starter, served with braised artichokes and a regional Tuscan pasta inspired by a trip to Italy. Every meal we had peachy pasta, which is essentially it's like a hand-rolled spaghetti. Quite chewy and quite noodle-like. That's something we wanted to kind of emphasize with this dish. Madiha's first challenge will be to ensure the peachy pasta is cooked and served al dente. It's going to be about three minutes. Everything happens quite quickly. Quite quickly. Okay, so the timing <laughs> is going to be quite important. In the three minutes it takes to cook the pasta, you're not just going to be doing, doing this. Doing this, yes. Okay? Madiha will have to braise the artichokes. And how long do they take? Not even a minute. And grill the red mullet, which can burn in seconds. So under the salamander, very intense heat. Cook it quickly, and it won't dry out. The cooking of it is very last minute and very quick. No darker than that. I think a lot of the challenge in service with that dish is in the timings. So that's, that's three minutes. They're not soft, mm -hmm. you know? OK, it's still going to have bite to it. The peachy pasta must then be evenly coated in a verjou butter emulsion. These are all the components to plate it. you got to be quick, be deliberate, be confident. The difference between cooking a dish like this at home and cooking in a restaurant is that you've got all these multiple things that have all got to be cooked and warm at the same time. There you have it. Wow. So <laughs> How are you going to make that in a few yes. hours? Do you feel confident? Think you can do that? I'll try my best. <laughs> Confidence is another thing. I mean, wow. To be honest, I have never seen a star chef painting up in front of me. It's a beautiful looking dish, and I hope I pull it off. I don't do anything silly. Madiha's first job. Oops is the painstaking task of filleting and deboning the red mullet. I've never filleted a fish before. Normally, fishmongers does that for me. Yeah. You need a telescope to take these out. They're tiny. And the last thing I want is John and Greg saying, Oi, you forgot to take out the bone. Tom is taking on a main course of pigeon, which will be served with persimmon, a fruit popular in Southeast Asia. Have you used persimmon before in desserts? But this is the first time that I've ever used them in a savoury context. You want to get these sliced, seasoned, and just warming. They need to become a little softer. The biggest challenge for Tom will be mastering cooking the pigeon over a 400-degree charcoal barbecue. Are you comfortable with charcoal wood cooking? We'll soon find out. I've not done uh, much before, but... Uh... OK. It's not easy. They're going to have to cook each bird individually. It's going to be like less than a minute for each bird, OK? We just want intense heat very quickly to kind of get the color and get that flavor into the outside of the pigeon. You cook it over, that flavor becomes very unpleasant. 
that's the kind of coloring we want. Yeah. All the dishes are challenging, but if it was me, you want to be on the grill. That's where you want to be. As well as getting to grips with the barbecue, Tom will have to juggle cooking three different garnishes. Comfy pigeon legs. They're quite small, OK, very delicate. Kale leaves and chervil root in spiced butter. You know, normally in the restaurant, this dish would be put together by two different people. One person cooking the meat, one person cooking the garnish. You're doing this all by yourself. The persimmon fruit is served as slices infused with a smoked olive oil. This is a gremolata that's quite sharp, quite bitter, but it's going to help with the rest of the flavors on the dish. So just a little bit of that there. The dish is finished with a persimmon puree and a spiced pigeon sauce. Just make sure you've got enough sauce in the plate, OK? That's going to be it. But the most important thing's got to be the cooking of that pigeon. Work in front of house, managing in quite a well-known chicken restaurant. I'm quite used to seeing the grills, but the birds that we cook on those grills are a lot different from the birds that we'll be cooking today. Got, what, about 15 pigeons to get through? Lots of work to do. When you're prepping those birds, if you're not careful, you could put the knife right through it and you've ruined it. It's similar to chicken, like the anatomy is all kind of the same, but it's a lot smaller, so it's a lot more fiddly. Claire will be responsible for the final course. I've got some potato terrine. I'd never imagined I'd eat potato for dessert. It's a dish inspired by Hokkaido potato, an ingredient Johnny discovered while on a business trip to Japan. To be honest, it was amazing. Probably the best jacket potato I've ever had. We knew we'd need to do something with that. The result was a baked potato meal foy, consisting of four technically challenging elements. The first is a delicate puff pastry, which has been made with the Hokkaido potato. This is kind of how we want our puff pastry, because it's quite important that you get the cooking right. Otherwise, you're going to end up with something, instead of being kind of crunchy, it's going to be kind of chewy, OK? OK. Each meal foy will need to be assembled to order. This is a potato caramel, a normal caramel, but with potato puree in it. Our next component is a ganache. Potato puree, sake, and white chocolate, which is pretty crucial. If it's too loose, you're going to end up with something that's going to collapse. The meal foy is topped with a caramelized confit potato terrine. There's so much technique going on there, and it's a lot of prep. If you don't get those elements right, your service is going to be a nightmare. The final component is a sake and butter gelato. One of the hardest bits in service is actually getting the gelato from the container, you know, into a nice shape and then getting that onto the plate. You make that look so easy. Any questions at this point? I think I just need to take it all in, really. You'll have all your components ready. If you start trying to build this ahead of time, it's going to collapse. <laughs> I really like the idea of savoury foods being used out of context. It's my kind of dessert. Claire is rolling out the potato puff pastry Oops. that, once baked and portioned, gives the meal for its structure. Probably the most challenging bit is getting the pastry right. Roll it properly, get it all to the same thickness, the cooking of it, to get all that where it needs to be is quite time consuming. You need to have kind of a bit of patience there. It's not really me, is it? It's all being precise and exacting. I'm much more random. This is when I burn myself, isn't it? There's just 90 minutes until service. And Madiha is making good progress with her prep. I'm just going to finish on the fish, and then I will be going to go on the peachy pasta and roll it out. I hope, fingers crossed, everything will be ready in time. Getting the pasta right, it's a technique in terms of rolling it without breaking it. I like pasta, yeah. but I've rarely made pasta okay. myself. If you go too fast, you're going to snap it. 
or you're going to get something really skinny in the middle and really fat on the end. Oh, that wasn't too good. It's a delicate business. <laughs> They've got to make 11, 12 portions. Come on. That's going to take them a while. How many more I have to do? How's it coming with the PT? I'm trying my best to make it equal sized. Yeah, looks like you've got the technique though. Have yeah. I? It's not really skinny in the middle yeah. and fat on the ends and stuff, so just keep up with the speed, okay? Make more pasta. Yeah, pack on. Pasta. Yeah. <laughs> on the pigeon main, Tom's got all the birds prepped and has moved on to making a yogurt based marinade for the crown. So I'm not quite used to working with these quantities. I think this is probably the biggest mixing bowl that I've ever seen. Normally, I'm just grinding things for maybe one or a couple of people. But there's still a lot to do. After this, I've got to prep the chervil roux, prep the kale. I think I've got a couple of sauces and garnishes to kind of get ready. So it's going to be a busy day, I think. And he's not the only one with a huge workload. You got a few things going on at the, at the moment, right? You need yeah. to manage these jobs. Yes. With the puff pastry still baking, Claire's now working on the potato caramel filling, which involves adding mash to melted sugar. Mashed potato and sugar. Who knew? We could start a craze. Oops. But achieving the perfect colour and texture on the potato puff pastry is proving to be a struggle. No, really isn't cooking. Do you think that's done? No. It doesn't look done enough to me. Yeah, put it back, put it back. Give another three, four minutes, and then we'll check it again, OK? I feel better when all the puff pastry is out. It's frustrating. Medea, just so you know, it's 45 minutes till service, OK? Right. We've got to uh, get a move on now, OK? Because you're, you're the starter, right? Yes, All right. I am. With the clock ticking, Medea's not even halfway through rolling out her 12 portions of peachy pasta. I would say I'm a bit nervous. Madiha with the starter at the moment. All the work she's doing is, is very good, but she hasn't started the sauce yet, which is a bit of a worry. I'm going to start panicking in a minute. Things are far more on track with Tom, whose pigeon is marinating, and he's moved on to preparing his garnishes. I think everything's going to plan at the moment. I don't really know whether I'm, like, miles ahead or miles behind. Come back to me when service starts, and it might be a different story. Wow. After multiple attempts to perfect her potato puff pastry... Yay. Thank God. Hurrah! Claire's finally been successful. But she still needs to cut it into 36 identical rectangles. The layers are coming apart a bit. Really not going to plan. I thought I'd have made the gelato by now, but I haven't. Still quite a bit to do for her, actually. No! With that course in particular, it's all about your mise en place being right. It's not mixed up enough. When you go into actual service, if it's not right at that point, there's not much you can do. Oh. It's 12.30. And the guests are arriving for lunch. This is the first time they've been in a professional kitchen. This is a completely different level. This is a part of the competition I'm sure they've all been dreaming of. Is it going to be a dream come true or is it going to be a nightmare? With orders due in a matter of minutes, Madiha has finished rolling her pasta, but has only just started the verjou butter sauce that will coat it. We're really struggling for time, so you need to concentrate on this now. Emulsifying all that butter into the sauce takes a while. The guests are seated. It's not an ideal position to be in right now. I am under pressure because I'm a little bit late. That sauce needs to come down. The fact is, this is a restaurant service. They're not feeding the pain public. They're feeding somebody far more critical, the team. I know what to expect from these dishes. Whoever holds their nerves best, they'll probably do the best. 
The first orders are in, but Madiha is still racing to finish her butter sauce. We can delay slightly, but not a lot. Timing is imperative. One little slip up, and it knocks the rest of the service out. Can't do that. Can't afford to do that. We're quite behind. We have to go now. Yes. OK, right now, I need you to do two and two. OK. okay? You know what to do. Let's go. With Madiha finally ready for service, she now has just three minutes to ensure her pasta is cooked al dente, as well as braising her artichokes and perfectly grilling the red mullet. Keep an eye on it. It's bubbling up. Yeah? Yep. Is it looking okay? Yeah. Okay, let's see. Have a look underneath. Okay, I put it back under just for a minute. 30 seconds more. I mean, we're quite late. But I think it's just really important, even though you're late, you, the food's got to be right. That looks OK. But the next one's a little more care, OK? Yep. A lot to kind of monitor right now, yeah. OK? This is about a bowl of pasta at fine dining level. Just work as quick as you can, OK, keeping things hot. Madiha's food is lovely, but it's big. I'm hoping Madiha is going to learn the beauty of a little bit of minimalism, a little bit of style. You're happy with the fish? It's cooked OK? Yes, I'm happy with the fish. Service, please. So it's two more now, yeah? Yep, two okay. more. Okay. I'm used to cook a lot at home. It's never been time pressured. I've been running around like a headless chicken. It's not easy. They've done a great job with the fish. Sometimes it's very easy to overcook the fish. I like the texture of the peachy pasta, slightly more al dente than a normal pasta, which I really enjoyed. And the artichokes just kind of finished it off. Oh, wow. My fish is beautiful. Crispy skin, flaky flesh. For Madiha, this is really dainty. This is a very pretty, smart dish. There's no bones in there. The pasta has all been rolled by hand, and it all looks consistent. She's done a great job. So you've got it now, just a bit more speed, OK? On the main course. Let's go. Tom also has his first orders for the pigeon. Tom is going to experience one of the most difficult cooking processes known to man, the barbecue. It's not like an oven where you can just set it to what you want. You can't burn the outside. Keep moving it. That's it. This is pigeon perfection. You kind of want that colour you got, but all yeah. over, right? Looks OK, or...? OK, you got it. While his first pigeon crowns rest, he now needs to juggle cooking the kale, confit leg, and chervil root garnishes. You underestimate how much there is to do right at the last minute. Let's carve the first two pigeon, and then we're going to start plating. With the pigeon crowns ready to carve, Tom's about to find out if they're cooked to chef's exacting standards. Cooking on that pigeon looks really good. Thank you gather everything else and we come up to the pass. He's made it to the pass. Join his both hands if you can. But now has to present all eight elements flawlessly. Let's Looks good, Tom, see. but quick as you can, OK? Yeah, no worries. Tom is a restaurant manager. He understands front of house. So you'll understand how important it is for the chef to make sure every single dish is absolutely perfect. And then duck. Well, today we're serving pigeon. Yes, we are. Okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, that would help. Service, please. So that was great, Tom. OK, just like that again. Yeah. But faster. Mmm. Oh, how lovely. It's not easy to be in a professional kitchen, especially over the grill. The grill is absolutely roasting hot. Thank you. The whole thing was put together very nicely. The pigeon breast was cooked to perfection. I think for an amateur, it's amazing that someone could do this. It's a great job. A huge amount of work. The persimmon, it's sweet, going beautifully with the game bird. The pigeon breast is cooked beautifully, and those legs are soft as you like. That is lovely. 
Well done, Tom. We've seen some fantastic desserts from Claire. She's great with one plate, but can she replicate it and make sure every single dessert is absolutely perfect? It is really tricky to be this dainty in this environment. She has all four components for the meal for you standing by. Never made ice cream like this before. And is checking on the sake gelato. That's good. <gasps> yeah, it smells like ice cream. I can smell the sake. With the sake gelato churned and ready, she can start stacking the layers. Oh! Try to use the, uh, the spatula the as spatula. much as you can. You need to be more efficient with your movements, yeah. OK? Meal feu is assembled. Claire now has the challenge of creating the perfect roche of sake gelato. <sighs> the gelato, to get that to look consistently right, takes a lot of practice. OK, you happy with those, yeah? Uh, they're not fantastic. OK. I'm going to improve. So two more now. It may be delicious, but it could be more dainty. It was really good. Whoever did it was brilliant, because it looks quite difficult to execute, so I thought it was really good. The texture was crisp and creamy. It was like a proper dessert uh, from Trivet. Oh, isn't that beautiful? The thinness of the pastry is wonderful. It's really delicate. Nicely done. Back on the starters, Madiha is struggling to keep up with the fast kitchen pace. I'm just plating this table to catch up a bit. She's got the rhythm down, but it's uh, just that needs to be a lot faster. Doing something which I've never done before in life, so it's a learning curve and a very steep one. Service, please. It's really rustic cooking, yet not rustic at all. There's also no let up for Tom on the pigeon main. The cooking's good. We just need to find a way to speed it up. It's really fast paced, but I'm enjoying it. Just want to get it all out perfectly now. Service, please. That's better. All like that. Perfect, thank you. On dessert. That's it. Claire's getting to grips with the delicate assembly of her millefeuille layers. Easy, easy. That's it. They look all right. But she's yet to master the perfect gelato rocher. Oh, come on. Mm. Stupid. Yeah. Service. I'm annoyed, I'm frustrated that I'm not being efficient, and I could be more efficient. With Johnny's help... Service, please. Madiha's starter orders are back on track. You're going to get ready on the last three. They're going to be your best three plates, OK? Sure. And you're going to do those. How's it feel? You're almost there. Okay. You've been an absolute pleasure to work with. We're not done yet. <laughs> So pasta on each plate, okay? Yes. Then all the artichokes, then all the fish. One, two, three. Yes. I just got the gist of how it feels to be in a professional kitchen. It's not easy. When you're ready, you call service, yeah? They're your plates. Service, please. You did really well. OK. Well done. I would say it was a reality check. It wasn't easy, but it was fun, it was enjoyable. I've learned a lot. On mains. Almost there, Tom. Almost there. Tom's also got his last pigeon orders at the pass. You're only as good as the last one, yeah? Indeed, yeah. Amazing that I've managed to put food up like this. Just fast now, yeah? Service, please. You did very well. Thank you okay, very much. Be proud. 
not an easy dish. No. Okay? <laughs> well done. Thank you. Saying that this is a dish that normally two people are preparing to have done it by myself, I think. I've not done too badly, hopefully. With service drawing to a close, it's Claire's last chance to impress Johnny with her rochets. So three rochets and then lift yeah. them onto the plate. Let's go out on a high. That one looks a lot better than last time. Keep going. Stay with it right to the end, OK? These look really good. Service, please. Okay. Wow. I'm just going to have a lay down somewhere. After a gruelling seven hours in a professional kitchen, the amateur's first restaurant service is finally over. Overall, considering that none of the three have ever cooked in a commercial kitchen before, I think they did amazingly well. We've really enjoyed it. The contestants have been amazing. Every different dish we've had was done beautifully. What a wonderful way to start the semi-finals. I'm really proud of them. I think right now there'll be a mixture of elated and absolutely exhausted. It is intense. If you'd have told me a couple of weeks ago that I'd be sending out food like that, I don't think I would have believed you. Adrenaline is running all over the place at the minute. It's been a wonderful experience. It was a bit of a time pressure. The service is a little bit late, but it wasn't a disaster. I knew it was going to be jolly tough, but I've learned so much today. It's been incredible experience. Next time, the semi-finals continue, and the second group of five will need to impress legendary chef Marcus <laughs> Waring. <laughs> A professional bit of cookery, wow. For a chance to cook in a professional kitchen. OK, two scallops to follow two cod to follow two pigeon. This is an absolute baptism of fire. I mean, this is a very smart restaurant and this is beautiful food. Yeah, it's gone back to the kitchen. It's raw in the middle. <laughs>